I'm going to take you out there and try to give you a glimpse of what it is to solve this puzzle that is this enormous universe uh, around us. This is, of course, something that, that uh, you, is a topic of a lot of research areas from fundamental physics, chemistry, biology, um, but I speak as an astronomer. And yes, when I was young, I remember, I think it was at a holiday in Greece, that I looked up at the sky for the first time, really seeing all those beautiful stars, um, not visible from uh, the big cities or in Holland where I came from. And um, I was fascinated and that fascination remained when I grew up and it became fascination about how things work, how things tick, physics in general. And uh, so I am very happy that I'm one of the lucky few who managed to make astronomy his day job maybe a bit less happy that it's the case in the also a night job. But uh, I um, today want to talk to you a little bit about a very recent piece of this puzzle that we're trying to solve, namely trying to unravel the secrets of dying stars. Now, that sounds maybe very sad or, or dangerous, but uh, it's actually very, very nice and, and very important because everything you see around you, this whole planet, you yourself, the chair you're sitting on, is made up of material that is created in stars. And if we want to understand how it gets here, how, how everything gets formed, we need to know how it goes out of these stars. So I'm going to give you a little bit of theory um, on what, uh, what is happening. Um, so astronomers roughly divide stars into two types. You have stars like our sun, maybe a few times heavier than our sun. And then you have the rare stars that are 10, 20, even 100 times heavier. And these stars, they live short, they burn bright, they enter life into spe in spectacular supernova explosions. And in those explosions, material is flung out into space. Uh, and those are mainly the heavy elements, iron, and those kind of things that, of course, make up all those cell phones that has been talked about uh, recently. Um, so, but a lot of this, the material that makes up us is carbon, oxygen, the more common elements, and they are actually made into stars like our sun. And they live a lot longer. They don't die as spectacularly in an explosion, although, as you will see later, they are still quite spectacular. Um, and they provide all this, this material. And this um, material is generated in nuclear reactions going on in the core, in the center. So already now our sun is burning hydrogen into helium in its center, and that's creating the energy that is uh, basically powering it, powering us uh, uh, when it's not cloudy. And um, when this core is, is uh, basically exhausted, when the, the hydrogen um, is, there's not enough hydrogen anymore, the star quickly starts to die. It swells up to enormous sizes, 100 times bigger than our current sun, and starts to, uh, to create the other elements, like uh, carbon, oxygen, in its center. And these are then transported outwards throughout the mantle of this big star that you see behind me, uh, until it reaches the surface, where, by means still very much unknown, it is blown out into space. It's blown out into space to be later, again, incorporated into new planets, new stars, uh, things that formed our sun, for example, is a third generation star. So there have been others before it that provided all the elements that make up us. But as I said, it's still not known what creates this wind. How is this material transported? And, and we need to know this, not only to know how this material comes um, to be and made up, making up new stars, but also uh, in this wind, dust and other molecules are created. And this is the type of dust uh, that we are seeing in galaxies very far away in the early universe when galax galaxies were just being formed. And uh, for a lot of the time, astronomers look at these galaxies, this dust, and infer what's going on. How does these galaxies evolve to the galaxies that, like what we live in now? But to do this properly, we need to know really how much dust is formed by how many stars and all these things. And for that, you need to look at these individual dying stars to see what's going on. But of course, to look at these, that is really difficult. So here you again see this fascinating picture uh, of our galaxy. You see all the little pinpricks and uh, you see 
dust lanes and other things. And here you see a zoom in to one of those dying stars. And you see how extremely detailed we have to look to study this. You see a zooming through um, a dark dust lane. You see it going. You, you haven't spotted the star yet, but you will with one of those stars that, uh, that we study to see what's happening, what's, uh, what is really driving all this material out into space to, to go into the other stars. But if we want to study this in so much detail, we need really special instruments. We need um, bigger and bigger telescopes, more powerful. Um, of course, the easiest would be to say, well, we need just one telescope, 100 times bigger, uh, and we can see in all, this, in all this detail. Unfortunately, that is, of course, uh, unfeasible. It is too expensive. It is, um, uh, these telescopes will collapse uh, under their own weight. The biggest telescope so far is a 300-meter telescope in Puerto Rico that listens to radio waves coming from space. It might pick up the music that, was, uh, that, that is expected back by one of the previous speakers. And um, so, but to go bigger, that wouldn't work. But fortunately, there's a technique that comes to, to our help. If we use a lot of small telescopes that individually would see big pieces of the sky, like here, and we put them apart and we combine their signals, we can actually generate the telescope much bigger. We, uh, in, in this illustration here, those four telescopes would see as detailed as that one big telescope. So we just build many of them, we spread them out. At the moment, there are already a network all across the world that can generate a telescope as big as the world. Um, of course, all these telescopes li look in different, um, different wave uh, frequency regimes, um, but to study this dust, these molecules coming out of these dying stars, as well as the dust uh, molecules around young stars that are being born, and, and the, the, this dust that I talked about really far away, we need a special type of instrument. And to build something like this, something that can really peer into the heart of stars, um, is such a big project that could never be done um, by any one country alone. So after many years of planning, finally, um, a whole collaboration of Europe, North America, East Asia, a uh, big part of the world has come together to build one of those big instruments. They're currently still building it, although we're already doing science with it. And it's being built in the Chilean desert, uh, in one of the driest places on Earth, high up, and it's called the Atacama Large Submillimeter Array, or ALMA. Here you see a few of those antennas, and these will work together to give us new glimpses of space, new glimpses of these dying stars or of the young stars. So they work together as illustrated in this little movie, and you'll see this is only a few of the telescopes. Eventually there will be 66 telescopes moving together and um, this was when the very first observation was taken. Only a few telescopes were working at that point. Uh, but you see how the telescopes basically look at the sky all together at the same time when it and its signals will be transported to, into a huge computer and will be combined to form astronomical images that we are there to understand and to try to uh, explain. So um, this project uh, started observing already last year when not even half of the telescopes were there and already then it, it was the best of its kind and we were very happy to use it, this for one of our projects to look at one of those dying stars and it wasn't very easy because in this first um, call for interest for proposals there were enough proposals submitted from across the entire world uh, for which we would have needed 10 such instruments. Um, so all kind of interesting pieces of the puzzle that are still need to be solved and um, so we're, we're still going to go far with it but we fortunately got some results of it I want to show you really one of the first first real glimpses what our plan was we wanted to observe one of these dying stars and these stars at the end of their life every 10 20,000 years they undergo a um, sort of mini explosion and in this explosion they will throw material molecules dust into space and they will form these rings, these shells that you see there. And in particular, uh, we wanted to observe the molecule carbon monoxide uh, that is abundant around these things, around these stars, um, in a shell like top, the top left corner. Uh, and we wanted to really look in detail with the, the, the details that this new instrument gives us. And we wanted to know really what's going on there. Uh, now, you have to remember, molecules, they emit 
light radiation at a very specific frequency. And much like an ambulance that goes towards you, drives away, this frequency changes depending on the velocity of this uh, molecule, uh, if it's moving towards you, away from you. So what this allows us, by looking at this molecule, to actually make a three-dimensional image of, this, of a shell like that. Now, the source that we looked at is the one in the middle, but this is a Hubble Space Telescope picture of the dust, so it doesn't have this three-dimensional um, image, but this is more like a transparent football that you're looking at, at the, uh, from the top, and you're seeing everything projected on the sky. So what we looked at was the star in the middle, and um, this is actual astronomical data that that's, um, will actually be published tomorrow. Um, so this is one of those velocity channels of the gas moving towards us. Here you don't see anything yet. And if I step through this movie, you will see first the gas coming towards us, then going away from us. And we expected to see the shell, that uh, type of shell that, we showed, that I showed before. But we were quite surprised and, and very excited um, to see that there was more. There was all this material in the middle, and there is, it stops here. There's this wonderful spiral that we completely puzzled us. We were, um, I still remember the excitement of, of running through the corridors, uh, talking to colleagues, trying to figure out what was happening. Unfortunately, we very quickly realized what was, uh, what was happening. There is another star around this, a star that was previously unknown, very close, moving around this, uh, this uh, dying star and creating, uh, like a boat moving through water, creating a wake. Here you see uh, a movie that we made to explain this. You see uh, to the right, you see this dying star. It's creating a wind of material. You already see this spiral. And now you see this explosion, this mini explosion going off that I talked about. You see it moving out and you see this spiral forming uh, on the inside. So basically, uh, we can very nicely explain what we're seeing. But what was even more important, because we can now basically trace all the way back from this explosion to the current day, we actually can ex exactly say how much material, how much dust, how much molecular uh, molecules have been expelled into interstellar space by this star in the last 2,000 years. And of course, this is this small piece of the puzzle which we then com can compare with predictions. And we found that it's much more than what's predicted. So this will alter our understanding, our theories that I say are needed to basically um, be able to understand what's going on throughout our universe. So these small pieces of the puzzle are needed also, for example, to understand how do stars like our sun evolve? What is the future of a star like our sun? Um, once we know that, we can say maybe our sun will develop into one of these beautiful um, planetary nebula, beautiful images. Um, would be wonderful if our sun be could become one of them, of course, uh, very far in the future. But um, all these kind of small puzzle pieces are needed to, um, to answer these questions. And uh, fortunately, all these observations throw up new questions, which, keep, which f to me are the most fascinating, trying to come up with unexpected answers. And uh, of course, if we would have all the answers, uh, then I could quickly start looking for a different job. But that's hopefully still far away. Uh, but we're getting there. We're getting closer and closer to finishing this whole picture of what's going on, on how our universe evolves, how stars are formed, planets are formed, life is formed. Of course, this is a synergy of many, many different, um, uh, different research areas, uh, but also um, as, as shown in this big, uh, with this big instrument, it needs uh, collaborations crossing political boundaries, cultural boundaries. People have to um, work together um, because alone we cannot, uh, we cannot solve this puzzle. We need to work as a unit, uh, as everybody together, uh, to solve what's going on. Uh, but I think our future is, is really exciting um, with more and more of these international collaborations. And, and I'm very excited to be part of this. And I hope you're excited to see the results that I've shown today. Thank you.